All righty, so we're back. This is take two, so hopefully this is working okay. Uh, I've just noticed that my friend Anthony's just posted in the comments there that there was a little bit of buffering. That's the problem we had on the first time this we tried to do this this evening. So, folks, let me know. Let me know if there's any buffering issues. Uh, I'll try and tweak something if I have to, but we shouldn't really have to. Uh, Brian there's posted that the video and audio are solid. Well, there you go. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it'll stay like that. But folks, thanks so much. Those of you who started watching me an hour ago, if you've returned, thank you so much for that. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some research and some very, very quick researching steps on some recent pictures that I took only using my iPhone on a recent, uh, recent road trip that I did in North Wales and Anglesey with two friends of mine. These two fellas just here. You've got Anthony on the left and Brian on the right, two of my closest friends. Uh, we had a great few days away it went from Thursday through to Sunday and like I said the the only thing we could take was our iPhones for taking photographs so it was a great experiment there's one comment actually that somebody posted to me which I need to find again and share it because it was really wise stuff I see Lee's just posted that it's buffering again hold on one second let me just see if I can change something no I can't change it while it's running buffering now there's got to be there has to be an issue maybe with uh, YouTube I'm going to, Leah, I know you've posted it. I'm going to keep on going. So hopefully you're the only one that gets it like this. But before I do anything, again, just a quick bit of admin. Photoshop Virtual Summit 5 is starting tomorrow. This is the last day. Oh, Anthony says it's buffering as well. Oh, blimey. I don't know what is going on with YouTube. I've no idea. Don't see buffering. -ish. Brian, I get that you're not seeing it. Um, right, folks. What do we do? Do we just go for it or what? <laughs> do we just go for it or what? What do you reckon? Okay, we got a few people not, not get any buffering. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to quickly put in a graphic and then I'll start because that's where I can cut it to in YouTube once it's actually posted live. So I'll put a little graphic in here now. I'll just put this on and then we'll start and I'll show you the retouching. Alrighty, a few people saying just go for it. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. First bit of admin then. This is obviously for the replay on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, Photoshop Virtual Summit starts tomorrow, the 30th. Today and tomorrow morning is the last time you can get your free pass. So there is the free pass link that you need to get your free pass to watch it. The classes are going to be released Monday through Friday. And every day that they're released, if you don't get the VIP pass, you can still watch it for free. But you have 48 hours from when they start to then be able to watch the whole lot. So you get the whole lot for free. I will put that link in the comments, sorry, in the description part of this video once the live side of things has finished. But what I want to go through then is the retouching for image that I took with my, uh, with my iPhone while on a North Wales road trip. Uh, the images that I'm going to go through are these ones here. Let me just dive over to show you. Here's just some of the ones, actually. Just this, this is kind of all the ones I've edited so far up to this point from the trip. A couple of portraits. Couldn't help myself being a uh, portrait mainly guy. But we're going to go through the quick edits of this one. And there's some extra little pictures here. Fantastic place called Penmon. These pictures here were very, very quick snaps. Our idea to go here was my friend Brian's on the last morning we had. And it could not have been better. I mean, the conditions there, I mean, just phenomenal. Glass like water, and we had this wonderful mist coming across the lake as well. So fantastic time, really good four days, and carrying hardly any kit. Uh, and William has posted, are the pictures iPhone raw? They're actually, good, great question, William. They are raw images. They're Bayer raw DNG files. Uh, they're not the iPhone Pro Res, if that makes sense. What they are, or Pro Raw rather. What they are is DNG files that have come from using these apps. So what I'll do is I'll show you first of all. Let me show you. The, this is the image we'll go through, and I'll show you the actual um, picture. Sorry, the actual app that I use. This is the one that we'll retouch. This is the app that I used to take the picture with. It's Reexpose. It's made by a company called Reflex, and it's a long exposure app. And now this app here, you can take pictures from half a second up to bulb mode. So you can do some incredible stuff with it. Now, I did have somebody ask me a question in the first time I started to do this video. Why do I use that one and not another one called Even Longer? 
I'll be honest with you, it's because purely the, the first reason, and that's what got me over to Reflex's content, uh, Reflex's apps, was the interface. I find it much more user-friendly, much clearer, much easier to use. And I don't have to think too much when I'm out and about. I just enjoy where I am, put the settings in, and just let it do its thing. So it works a treat for me. That's why I love the apps that they make. They're very, very simple to use, but the results are just wonderful. So let's have a look then. This is the pitch we're going to go through. Now, I'm not going to go through every single step and what I mean by that is this particular picture you can see here there's quite a few other images because this particular final image this one here is actually a combination of these images here there's about 10 images in total that I took to make this one final image let me just zoom in to show you why that is if you look at the horizon line which I appreciate isn't straight at this moment but if you look at the waves can you see how they're all different in every single shot so what I tend to do is I will take a number of images when I'm at the sea, at the, at the coast, and you get that movement in the waves and the water surface. And rather than me trying to capture the whole scene, the whole feeling in one picture, I take a number of pictures and then I blend certain parts from each of them into one to then hopefully make a picture that kind of encapsulates the whole feel of what it was like when I was there. Now, I've got a video on that already. One of my classes going out at the summit, it goes into even more depth about it and creating black and whites and what have you. But what I'll do for this is just show the actual, the main steps, but not the blending. I'll show you what I did to get that final kind of look as well. So let's just dive over into Lightroom then. And what I'll do is I'll just choose one of the images to work on. Let's see if I can find one that's got the most kind of activity going on into the actual waves. I'll go for, I'll go for that one. All right, so this is the image that I'll work on. First things first, I don't, uh, obviously the horizon line isn't so straight. So I'll come over to the right hand side in the develop module, choose the crop tool and I'll just click on auto. Uh, and that hasn't done a very good job this time around, does it? So let's just click on the ruler. I'll click on the actual horizon line, drag across, and take it to there. There you go. So a nice straight horizon line. Now, when I look at a picture, the first thing I tend to do is go, right, what is it that jumps out at me that needs to be done first? Obviously, it was the horizon line, but next to me is kind of like the, the highlights look a little bit too much. So that then leads me over to the right-hand side, and I'll just drag down the highlights. And already, this is starting to look better. But there's stuff in the foreground. This sky and the, and the actual waves and everything looks great. But this area down here in the foreground and going into the middle ground just looks a little bit kind of flat, a little bit dull. And also, we've got this kind of rock pool here, which I really wish when I took this picture I had the circular polarizer that reflex do the new G series one here because I could have cut through the detail in the water look if I zoom in on it you know there's stuff there but it's not quite so clear however I can do something with it and this is what I actually did in the final image I'll go to the masking section and I'll just get a simple brush make sure that the feathering is quite high flows all the way up density and what have you I'll turn on the overlay and I'm just gonna brush over this rock pool just to see if there's any tools I can use within there that might help to kind of fake the look, if you like, of a circular polarizer. It's not gonna be perfect, but at least to bring out some more detail than what's there rather than it looking flat and dark. Once I've done that, we'll turn off the overlay and I might now just zoom in just a touch. Now over on the right hand side then within the actual uh, Corrections I can make using a mask. We've got the tone area. I'll leave that for the minute, but I'm going to dive into the effects because here's where we've got the texture, clarity, and dehaze. Now, at the moment, the dehaze is quite high, sorry, the clarity is quite high, and you can see, particularly in this kind of top area of the rock pool, you can see how clarity is affecting it. It really is boost, you know, boosting up that highlight, and we don't really want that. That's kind of cutting, you know, that's restricting us looking through the water. So I'm going to bring the clarity down. But the one I am going to use is dehaze. And ordinarily, when you work on skies, you drag it to the left to darken. But I'm going to bring it over to the right. And you can see that as I do that, we are starting to get a little bit more detail coming in. But the side effect of that is, is that it kind of flattens it out and it kind of reduces the contrast. Let me just show, zoom in to show you. So you can see now, look, we're starting to see stuff. If I turn that mask off and on, off and on. We are seeing stuff, but it's starting to look a little bit flat. Now, this is where things like the texture slider can really come in. Now, if anybody remembers 
going back a few years now, we've got obviously Topaz Labs. They still exist. They've got some incredible software out there at the moment. But one of the most used bits of software they had back in the day was called Topaz Clarity. Now, that was Clarity, kind of like that we have in Lightroom and Camera Raw, but there were five, if I believe it right, five individual sliders for adding in kind of what they call clarity, but it was contrast of different levels within the image. And one of the sliders, the very top one, was called Micro Contrast, and it was phenomenal. It really was. It was like it dived into the minutest details of your pictures and added the really subtle but effective amount of contrast. That's kind of like what texture does, all right? That's what, that's what this slider does here. So if I dive back over into Lightroom, I'm only going to use the texture slider now, but hopefully this will show through as, I, as you see streaming. But look here, if I take that texture slider up, you start to see even more detail now on whatever it is underneath that water surface. Can you see that as it's starting to show up? Now, if I use the clarity, it's going to bring up the highlights you can see just there, which we don't want. But the texture definitely works. And I'm probably use that in combination with contrast. So just to add a little bit of a boost in there. So now look, again, let's turn this mask off and on. So there's off and on, off and on. It definitely adds a little bit more to the picture, I think. Obviously, in an ideal world, we would have had a circular polarizer, but this is kind of like a down and dirty circular polarizer. The next thing I'll do is just work a little bit more now on the foreground and middle ground area where we've got all these rocks and we've got the seaweed over it because, again, it looks a little bit flat and it could do with having a little bit more punch. So the way I did that, and this was really useful actually, because what this did was it kind of sharpened up all this detail on the rocks, so much so that I actually got a comment when I posted this online from somebody asking if I'd focus stacked the image, you know, where I'd focused, taken maybe three pictures, focusing on the middle, sorry, the foreground, the middle ground, the background, and blended them together, when actually I didn't do that at all. The focus range, if you like, on the uh, iPhone is kind of infinite, so that did a pretty good job anyway. But then doing this extra little bit now really enhanced it to make it look as if everything from right up close to way in the distance was nice and in focus. So all I did with that was uh, I'll get, a, get another brush. I'll go create a new mask. We'll get a brush. I'll turn on the overlay. And then all I'll do, I'll very quickly, just so we don't have to take too much time doing this. Obviously, when I did it for real, I did slow down a bit, obviously. But let's just brush over some of this kind of area here. Um, there we go, and this little bit down here as well. Turn off the overlay, and then I'll zoom in, so let's say 100%. Now, go to the effects panel, and already there's some clarity on that, and you can see how much of an impact that gives. I don't want to use too much of it, because again, it does tend to give it a bit more of a surrealistic look, and I don't want that, but I will add some clarity in. My favorite slider of all, though, is definitely texture. So we'll add some of that in. And of course, let's go to the Detail tab, and I'll just add a little bit of that in as well. So something like that. And I'm going to zoom in just a little bit closer now. Hopefully, again, this is showing OK as this streams through. But just kind of keep an eye on all the detail here, like the seaweed and the rocks. When I turn this mask off and on, off and on. So it gives it much more impact and does actually make it look to me, as I'm looking at my screen now, as if it is kind of a lot sharper and more in focus than what it probably really was. The last thing I did before I then sent this image over and kind of synced everything onto the other images that I'd taken and before I did the blending was to work on the seaweed itself. And this I did using the new software, or the new utility within Lightroom and Camera Raw down here. This is the point color. Now, if you've not seen it, the, the most recent pre-recorded video that I've posted is um, all about this point color. It is phenomenally good. It really, really is good, especially when you can kind of use masks within it to really dive down to focus on one particular color and work on that. It's really powerful stuff. So if you haven't seen it, definitely check out that video. Again, I'll put the links to that in the description part of this video. But let me just show you how I used it on this without going into too much detail, really, because I'll leave that for the for the main video. Uh, you can see there is a little bit of color in here. We've got the seaweed, these nice kind of burnt orangey browny kind of colors of the sweet seaweed. I need to enhance that because I want to give this more of a, a warm feeling. So what I'll do is I'll come over to the mixer section, 
choose point color and I'll click here on the point color sampler tool. I'll bring it over and you can see here we've got this loop view. Wherever I bring it over, you can see this kind of magnifying glass loop view. And I'm just going to click on a little bit of that seaweed color. And when I do press down, that color now is sampled over here on the right hand side next to the color sampler, so next to the point color sampler tool. And also in this long bar here, that's where it's all been sampled. Now, the way this works is wherever you've sampled, that's the color that you want, but you can then kind of refine it if you find that you're picking up other colors. So what you want to do is only affect the color you clicked on, not other ones. You can tell what colors you're affecting by using this button at the bottom here, visualize range. And I'll just turn that on. And what happens here, if I zoom out now, you can see that the majority, in fact, pretty much most of the image now really has gone black and white. And the only bits in color are the seaweed. And that's how this works. When you're using point color, this is kind of giving you a visual idea of, of like a mask, if you like. Everything that goes black and white means it's not going to be affected by what you now do. But the bits in color are what you are working on. It's, it is so incredibly powerful. But look how now I can make this seaweed stand out and how that's useful when I add the finishing touch. So what I'll do, now I know I've got that seaweed targeted, I'll turn off, in fact, no, I'll leave that visualized range on so you can see what I'm doing here. We've now got the hue, saturation, and luminance sliders here that I can affect to change the look of this uh, seaweed. I'm not gonna change the hue, I like the color of it as it is, but I can increase the saturation by using the slider here, dragging to the right. And you can see in this main area here, how that's also been represented. So if you don't want to use sliders, you can click in this main area here and drag around if you want as well. But I'll use the luminance slider. Look at this, look. Look as I move that extremely left and right. See how that's targeted just that seaweed. Just one click down and it targeted us. I think that's just incredible. So I'll take it to maybe, maybe about there will be enough, something like that. All right. Let's uh, zoom out again. Let's just come out of there like that, and we'll turn off the visualized range. Right, so at this particular stage here, what I then did was I worked on that one image. I then synced all that I'd done so far onto the other images that I was then going to use to blend bits from to make that final image. Now, like I said, I'm not going to do those steps because... Well, you don't want to sit there and watch me do it. There's a video I've got which kind of goes through all of that. But let's just imagine now that I've been to Photoshop, we've done that little bit of blending, putting in a few little bit of waves that I wanted into the final image, and now we're back in Lightroom so I can kind of then do some finishing touches. So this is the kind of stage that we're at now then. So what I'm going to do is I need to work on the sky. So let's just come out of the color mixer. I'll go back to the masking and we'll add a new mask and we'll go for select sky. That works really, really quickly. I'll turn on the overlay to see where it's working and you can see that it's actually gone a little bit too uh, over onto other parts of the image. If I zoom in, you can see that now. We've got it on the waves, we've got a little bit on the lighthouse. So I need to remove it off that before I do anything else. So I'll click on subtract and get a brush and we'll just carefully brush that, making sure I don't go above the horizon line because I don't want to remove it off the sky. So let's just take it off these bits, hold the space bar and click and move across and just brush it off these bits here. There's a little bit on Puffin Island. We don't want it on there. Let's just get it off Puffin Island like that. And this bit over on the side just here. All right, little bit on the light has got to be really careful. Whoop, got to be a little bit really careful when I take this. Let's make the brush just a little bit smaller and I'll brush it off the lighthouse. I probably don't need to go right to the edges. Whoops. Uh, but I'll just kind of do it fairly quickly so you can see what the actual process is anyway. All right, so, so let's say something like that will be good. I see Anthony's just posted that that seaweed looks exactly as I remember it. Yes, and I remember you, me having to tell you to get back because <laughs> that tide was coming in pretty quick, wasn't it, mate? Very, very quick indeed. Right, so that's the, uh, the sky mask there. Let's just zoom out. And now with that, let's just go to the uh, effects panel and just bring a bit of detail back in that sky. Now, when we use the dehaze, it's, it can be tempting to use, you know, quite extreme, but you can see here, one of the side effects is that it does oversaturate. So once I've brought the sky down to where I want it to be, I then always go to the color section and just reduce the saturation as well. So something like that. All right, last bit, and this, and this I just stumbled on for the look that I wanted to create. I'm gonna come over to the presets over on the left-hand side. 
Now, I've got my own presets just in here. Uh, these ones I'm going to go through in a moment because there's a picture of Anthony I'd used one of them for. But these ones on the left-hand side are all built in. You've got these already in Lightroom and Camera Raw. And you'll notice that some of them are actually supposedly specifically for portraits, all right? Now, what I'll say is ignore it. Ignore where it says portraits. Just open them up and try it. It is amazing when you go through some of these presets. Let's say if I use a landscape picture, I can look in the presets for a portrait and just kind of put my cursor over them and some of the looks are incredible. So don't disregard presets that are kind of supposedly just for portraits because you might find they give you exactly the look for the picture uh, for the for the uh, result that you want for your particular picture. Anyway, but you know, that said, <laughs> I did actually use one here that was called Seasons and I'll open it up and there's a summer season in here. And if I put my cursor over them in real time, I get to see what each of them does. And that can be really handy. We don't just see it in the small preview at the top on the left, we see it on the main image. And the one I kind of stumbled across, which I'd never used before, is this one here, SM02. And what I love about it is how it affects the clouds is a lovely magenta warmth added into the sky and the clouds and also on the ground as well. Love what it did there. So I'm just gonna click on that to apply it. And then just, we can then have the amount slider where we can actually really boost it up, obviously way too far, or just control it to bring it down just a touch more like say that. So that was all I did on that particular image, apart from obviously the blending. But let me just show you like the before and after, real simple. If we go click on this here, on the left-hand side before, the right-hand side after. Right, let's have a quick look at some questions that are just diving in here. Let's have a quick one. We've got this in, why do you apply presets after editing or is it just additional option? Now, that is a very, very good question. Now, though initially when I started editing this particular picture, I went through the process of bringing down highlights and bringing up the color on that seaweed and all that kind of stuff. Now, in this particular image, what I then would have done but I kind of didn't do it because I didn't want to take too much of your time up. I would have then synced all those settings on the other images that I wanted to then blend bits from into the main image. So that would have gone over into Photoshop. It would have been saved and then come back in to Lightroom, where if I looked in the develop module, there'd be no changes to the settings at all. They'd all be at their defaults of zeros and what have you. Then I would apply that preset. If I was never gonna send an image over into Photoshop, Pretty much most times I'll have a look at the presets first. And it was Dave Cross that kind of made me think about this a couple of weeks ago. Look at the name of it, preset, pre-settings. They're a great starting point. If you're kind of sitting there, you know, scratching your chin, rubbing your head thinking, I don't, I know I want to do something to this image, but what do I do? One of the best places you can go to to get inspiration is the presets because you can just put your open these folders up, regardless of what they're supposedly for, be it portraits and food and what have you, open them all up and just drag your cursor over the top and just look what happens to your images. Because as you do that, all of a sudden you might see a look that it gives and go, that's what I want. You can then click on it and because it's a preset, you can then dive in and tweak the settings. So they are a great starting point. You know, they really, really are. So I love, I love presets for that reason. But that's the only reason I kind of did it then ordinarily. I would just click it at the start and then work around it. Right. So there you go. There's the before and after. Hopefully you can see quite a dramatic difference. But really, when what we did, there wasn't that many steps to it. And talking about not many steps, let me now show you what I did with the picture of Anthony. Now, I'll show you the final image first of all, if I scroll down here. This is the uh, picture that I posted online, again, taken with my iPhone. Now, rather than using that long exposure app, the one I used this time for this picture was this app here. And this is called Reflex, it's R-E-E -E Flex. And it is their pro camera app where you can dive in and change all the kind of settings that you would want, obviously apart from uh, Aperture. Uh, but I use that all the time for when I'm taking regular pictures. And what I've actually done on my iPhone is I've, uh, this is the, the latest iPhone, you've got the action button. I've programmed it so I can just double tap on that and it brings up the Reflex Pro camera app straight away. Now, if I know I'm going out to do some long exposures, uh, I won't be using that app. So I'll then change which app is opened up on the action button. So I'll double tap on it and open re-expose. So it saves me kind of fiddling around, faffing about when I'm there at the time. 
That's what I love about doing all this kind of stuff. It, it minimizes the amount of kit I take and the amount of brain power <laughs> that I need. And the, obviously, the, also the things that I don't, it, the less I have to do, the less I can get wrong, if that makes sense. So I just double tap, I've got the app, I put up my holder, and I can just crack on. So that's what I do with that. But yeah, this picture here was taken with the reflex app, a very, very quick shot. And let me just show you what I did. I can show you first of all, the out of camera picture, which is this one. Uh, and let's go through the retouching steps. Dead simple, didn't even bother going into Photoshop, which is what I'm loving about it these days, is that I don't need to use Photoshop as much, okay? So let's go to the develop module. We'll come over to the right-hand side. We can see that it's not quite level. So again, we'll go to the crop tool. Let's see if auto works for me this time. Let's click on auto, and there we go, perfect. That's brought it in. Now, even though that's kind of done a nice, uh, made it nice and upright, there's some bits on the right hand side here where the paintwork on this shelter that Anthony's sitting in, for me, that's just a little bit distracting. I could clone it out, but I'll tell you what, that's just for speed. I'm going to bring in the crop just a bit from there just to get rid of it like so. All right, then, then just going on from what I just said, presets. Let's come over to the right hand side to the presets my user presets, and I've got one in here that I made called Dark and Moody. Now, I'll put a link again in the description to where the video is that I made this, so you can get all the steps that go into this particular preset, all right? And it's one that you can use to kind of increase the look of it way beyond what it was intended for, or you can bring it right down. But I'll, I'll put a link to the video showing you how you can make this. But this is the one that I went for. I'll click on dark and moody. We've got an amount slider at the top where I can increase it or decrease it. I actually brought it down just a little bit. So maybe something like that. Okay, once I've done that, let's come over to the basics panel. And I'll boost up the contra clarity here. Let's just give it a bit of a boost. There you go. That already for me starting to look how I wanted it to look. Really starting to bring out some detail in it. I'll always add a little bit of texture like so. The bottom floor here, this kind of uh, pier floor in this wooden floor in here is a little bit too distracting for me. So what I think I'll do, I'll get a mask and we'll just get a simple brush first of all. And we'll turn on the overlay and I'll just increase the size of it using my right square bracket key. Let's just turn on the overlay. There we go. And I'll just brush over the floor down here because I don't want my eyes to be drawn down to that bottom part. So we'll go for there. Turn off the overlay and let's have a look what we can do. I don't want to actually clarity works really well on that. And dehaze again, dehaze looks good on there, but can you see how that's changing the look of it? It's saturating it now, which doesn't look so good. But I like the actual detail it's bringing into the floor. So, like I said, whenever I use dehaze, I always follow it up by going into the color section and just desaturating it a little. So, there's definitely more punch in that floor there. If I just turn that off and on. But I do need to kind of direct the viewer's eyes onto Anthony, not onto this floor. So what I'll do is I'll add another mask. Let's just go for a linear gradient. And I'll just, uh, let's make sure there's no settings in here. We don't want anything on this mask here, apart from the tone. Let's bring the exposure down, something like that, and just drag up, like so. There we go. That's better. That for me, kind of takes the attention from the floor more towards Anthony. And talking of Anthony, let's have a look what we can do here. Let's go to the create a mask. We'll go to select people. Here we can see it's identified Anthony. If I put my cursor over, you can see it's got the red overlay. So I'll click on that. And then we get the choice here for different masks that we can create. But I'm going to do two different versions for this. I'm first of all going to choose entire person and click on create mask. And we can see that just up in here. I might even just rename it so I know what's what. So let's just call this one Anthony. There we go. And all I'm going to do here is just come to the shadows because obviously he's wearing dark clothing and is in this dark kind of uh, cover here. Let's all that exposure's been brought down. Let's just set that back to zero. There we go. I'm going to bring up the shadow detail just a little bit. Only needs to be a touch just to lift him off that background just a little bit, something like that. And you can see already there's before and after, before and after. And then what I what also did was go back to the create mask, go to select people. Obviously, it finds Anthony, but this time I click on the facial skin mask. 
and I click on create mask and we can see that now look in the top here it says there's a mask it's got a name person one facial skin and all I'll do is just take that exposure slider up and just add a little bit of light on his face something like that I can see here Lenny's put it didn't it didn't select his butt I'm okay with that <laughs> Don't worry. I could always add to the mask there, but uh, I'm quite okay with that one, Lenny, but it's all right. Um, so that's what I do there, just uh, bring up the exposure. Now, what I like about this is to do that, that would have been a time when I'd ordinarily send the image over into Photoshop and I would then kind of work on the face and just bring up the detail in it. But Or, or maybe even in Lightroom or Camera Raw, I would then get a mask, get a brush, paint over his face, make sure I didn't paint anywhere else, and then do it. But now I can just very quickly go to select the, per the person's mask, facial skin, and just increase that exposure. And that's what I do. That kind of draws the attention now into the face, just like, like it has just done there. So I love that. Real simple to do. I don't know if there's anything else I'd want to do on this picture now, apart from one thing I do sometimes do. Let's just go a little bit more overall clarity something like that and uh, let's go down to the effects and add a little bit of grain let's just zoom in so we can see how much we want drag it to there let's get the grain i'll probably take that to around about 25 something like that cool i mean look at the quality of this this is an iphone photograph a mobile photograph blows me away what we can now do with these things it really does very exciting times but look very very few simple steps there with anthony's portrait and we've gone from, let's just do the before and after, before and after. Just incredible. Absolutely loving this stuff. So I'm using the re-expose for the long exposures and the Reflex, the pro camera app for taking these kind of pictures. Um, one more to show you. I'll just do one more picture because this one here is crazy stupidly easy. Let's have a quick look. The one I'll show you is this one here, which is the place that uh, Brian recommended to go which was Bala Lake, and you can just see, I mean, these pictures here look just wonderful. Oh, Mark Silva has just said, let's have a quick look here. Is the, uh, oops, let's bring it back up again. Sorry, Mark. Is the Anthony shot a JPEG or was it shot in iPhone RAW? Mark, because I was using it with the uh, Reflex app, uh, it was, it's a raw file. It's a Bayer raw file. Now, it wasn't the full 48 megapixel because I used the 5X telephoto lens. Uh, and that doesn't use the full 48 megapixel RAW that the iPhone 15 can do. That's actually a 12 megapixel, which nowadays you kind of think, well, that's 12 megapixels. That's not much. Check out my YouTube channel because I did a I did a print or got a company rather to print a picture, a seascape picture, 72 inches. That was a 12 megapixel Bayer RAW, RAW file. And it was amazing quality and it wasn't a case of viewing distance you had to stand way back to think wow that looked great like looking at like looking at a movie poster for example which when you look at them really close they're really bad you have to be further away from them this particular raw file this 12 megapixel bayer raw file that was printed at 72 inches you could have been this close to it and it was like wow my friend ian we did it in his studio he'd never seen it before he was so impressed so yeah, hopefully very soon technology is going to kind of, or the apps, the guys that they're making, the way that the iPhones are going, that that 48 megapixel will be available for every single lens that we've got. Because uh, apparently there's like six or seven lenses that you can use in this from 18 mil to 120. But they don't all use that full 48 megapixel, which is another good reason to get the lenses from uh, Reflex. But anyway, going back to these images here let's just turn off uh, mark's comment so this is um bala lake you can see we really dropped on lucky with it unbelievably beautiful morning with the glass water and the the mist as it was coming across the actual uh, lake there anyway but this picture here very very quick grab shot that i did when we pulled over into a lay-by before we then turned around to go back to the lake a different part of it but the out of camera shot or the out of iphone shot was this this is what it looked like taken with the five times telephoto so again the 12 megapixel it's not the full 48 megapixel but you know still the quality i'm very very impressed with but this is what i had to do in this i didn't really want this uh this bush kind of showing up on the right hand side although if it was kind of framed on the left hand side as well that could look quite idyllic but i didn't really like it being on there so all i did first of all then let's just send it over photo edit in and Photoshop. This is the only time that I went over into Photoshop for these particular this particular image. 
We'll just open it all up. And in here, again, we could use the clone tool, all kinds of different things, but you know, all I did here was just use that generative fill. And I'm, I'm finding I'm using generative fill only occasionally. You know, there was this big thing when it first came out, people panicking about it. It's going to be replacing all sorts of stuff. Honestly, hand on heart, I, I'm probably using generative fill as much as I used to use content aware and the clone stamp tool. So it's not an everyday thing. Uh, but that little bit area there, click on generative fill and then I'll click on generate. Give it about 10 to 12 seconds uh, for that to remove that so that we can then carry on. Uh, while that's doing that, we've got a question here or comment. I'm wondering what this lake photo would have looked like in JPEG with the iPhone's phone. Um, not it would it would have looked pretty good, I guess. It's a great question. Yeah, it probably would have looked really good. Uh, but I'm just a uh, I like I like using raw. <laughs> I like having more control over it. And plus, it kind of I, I wanted to have something to edit. If that makes sense. Right. So there you go.